Lord, lead us aright. Lead us in the path of righteousness. Lord, lead us to know you more. Lead us to enjoy you more. Lead us to be satisfied by you. Open our eyes, open our hearts that we might truly see life, that we might see ourselves, that we might see this world, that we might even see you and everything the way we are supposed to see things, the way you want us to see things, the way you created them to be in our eyes. Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Thank you everybody for really pitching in with your resources, with your efforts, um, with your resources, with your efforts towards um, Seekers Conference. Praise God. Um, God bless you. There's only God that can reward you. Amen. Thank you for having a heart for ministry. Thank you for having a heart for saving people who are lost and who do not know what the truth is. It's only God that can reward you. It's a fruit of your heart for God. And I pray and trust God that the Lord will bless you and keep you and increase your favor, your favor and desire for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. It's good to see everybody that came down. Um, special shout out to Jerry and Mackindy came all the way from different places. It's very nice. Thank you guys. God bless you. <clears throat> Amen. So Matthew chapter 5. Um, Victor around. No, 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 okay. Victor also came around. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hallelujah. Today we're going to take three beatitudes together. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I tried to see if we could separate it, but it couldn't really work. And um, it couldn't really work in my mind. Um, I don't know, I think it's the Lord that put it like that. And the reason is because, you know, let me just <clears throat> remind us of the busy thing. And then you see the reason why the three of them is good that we talk about them together. Um, you know, we've said that God is the good. God is the blessed one. <laughs> Mojo's mocked me now that am I, am I a Platonist? <laughs> Praise God. So like, um, um, like Origen said and Tertullian said, Plato was, God was speaking to Plato. We are the ones that write. It was only seeing a small revelation. Hallelujah. Anyway, um, sorry, that joke is for, is for two Bruce. Let's just go on. B blessed is, God is the blessed one. God is the good. So the truth is, and I've been saying over and over that in this world, because of the broken nature of this world, all of us are groaning. All of us, together with all of creation, we are groaning. We all have a sense of insufficiency, and it's meant to be so. We're, met, we're never meant to be self-sufficient. We cannot even be self-sufficient because God is the only one that is self-sufficient. Hallelujah. So we suffer. We suffer because of our inadequacies. We suffer because of the things that are lacking inside of us, the good things that are lacking inside of us. And so many times we try to feel what is lacking by um, the good things that God gives us. And truly, good things come from God. It's because God is even the good that good things come from Him. But the answer, the solution to our suffering, the solution to our inadequacies is not, um, is not those blessings. The solution to our inadequacy is God himself, who is the all-sufficient one, who is complete and who is perfect. If you are incomplete, the solution to your incompleteness is the one that is complete. Because if you imagine or you are deluded or this world lies to you, or you allow people to lie to you, to imagine or conceive in your mind that the solution to your incompleteness is one of these blessings or one of these goods, and those goods will solve the problems of your incompleteness, what you will find um, in believing that lie and living your life based on that lie is that 
you will find out that your insufficiencies will only get worse. Praise God. Your insufficiencies will only get worse. You think money is the solution to your problems, but it is not. The more money you have, the more you will see that money has problems. You think marriage is the solution to your sense of incompleteness? When you get married, you will see that marriage is not the solution. You think fame, popularity, glory, power is the solution to your problems, but it is not. You think that promotion in the office is the solution to your problems? It is not. It is not. God is the solution to all your problems. Knowing God for yourself, enjoying Him and being satisfied by Him is the solution, is what you actually need. Because when you know God and you enjoy Him and you are satisfied by Him, all the goods and the places where you feel like you are inadequate, you will find out that those blessings, those inadequacies themselves, God will turn them to blessings. Because God is using them to keep you in Himself. Hallelujah. So that is the reason why in all of Christian history you can see people who were poor but full of the joy of salvation. That's how it works. Someone can be sick and be rejoicing unto death. Meanwhile, someone can be rich and healthy and in a marriage that has every material thing but still be miserable. Hallelujah. So please, I will never stop reminding you of this. Don't let the world that we are living in now, especially, don't let it lie to you. The spiritual capital of capitalism in the world is America. Setting, because of that, because of that, certain ideas tend to come from that place. I said, I was I, we were doing a cursory look at history in the last 300, 400 years, and I discovered that all the recent heresies in Christianity in the last 300, 400 years, they all come from America. <laughs> because there's something going on there. The capitalism there, it distorts the way people think. It does something to their minds. And so that is the reason why you, you see what we are currently suffering now, the kind of context that we are in, is heavily American-centric, even our Christianity. Even our Christianity. And so we are being cooked in a certain context where we are taught that um, the goodness of God, the good is to have material things. Where the sign of the grace of God is how much money you have where the proof that God is with you is how rich you are, that the essence of salvation is to be rich and is to be healthy. It can only come from America at a particular point in time. In all of Christianity, in all of Christian history, you will have never heard that kind of thing. Never. Is it Paul or Timothy himself that was sick and will be telling you that Jesus died for me to be healthy? You understand that? Is it Paul that almost died in Galatia when he was preaching that will be telling you Jesus died for you? You understand? Hey, is it, you, you, you understand? Is it Paul that said that we're very, very poor? We thought we would daily die. They will not tell you that he's, he's, he might, cannot be rich, it cannot be God. Is it Paul that is I have seen Shege? He had a thorn in his flesh. God said, I'm not taking it because I know you can be proud. And if you, if you are proud, you just go to hell. So it's better for you to have it so that you can go to heaven. It's that kind of person that will say, if my faith says yes, God cannot say no. These are some ideas that can only come at a particular point. When you have eaten, you are beneficial. You understand? If you don't World War II, there's technological advancement, there's money, there's technology to make things happy. You are okay. That's when you can have some delusions and say, say some things. This is the reason why they'll be burning people, putting people at the mouth of lions, and their behavior during the martyrdom will be so powerful that God will now use it to save people. I was looking at um, Bruce Shelley's um, church history some, some time, so like two weeks back and all that, we were talking about martyrdom and everything. <laughs> people don't realize that the Romans, the more they were killing Christians, the more they were increasing. Do you know why? God was using the martyrdom to convert people. Imagine you, con- you gather people, you say, these people are the reason why the Roman Empire is getting weak. They are not worshipping the gods with us. The gods are angry with us. Let us kill them. You now gather them and put them in a place. Do, uh, what do you call it? Fake um, court, court this thing, a kangaroo court, and sentence the person to death. And then the person will now kneel down and begin like this to Jesus and say, Thank you, Jesus, because I'm coming. So I'll we'll be singing hymns. You'll now release lion on them. <laughs> the people watching will now be like, Ah, <laughs> next thing they're going to go and ask, Please, those people, which religion are they? And convert. You are killing people, their death is turning to evangelism.
the true, the beauty of Christianity, true Christianity, is in knowing God, enjoying God, and being satisfied with God. And so that is the reason why you see what Jesus calls blessed. It's not what we call blessed. So what Jesus calls blessed is not what we call blessed. So if you look through this, you will notice something. God calls every, Jesus calls, yes, God calls every state of heart, every state of affairs that makes a person more inclined to have God, to enjoy God and be satisfied with God, he calls that state blessed. If you have a state of heart, or if you have a situation around you, if you have a state of heart, if your heart is in a particular way, where it is inclined towards God, to enjoy God and be satisfied with God, and if you are in a situation, whether it is painful or comfortable, where it makes you inclined to enjoy God and be satisfied with God, Jesus calls that state blessed. Because God, if God is the blessed one, and that situation makes you come to him, then that situation is what? Blessed. So when you say blessed are the poor in spirit, that state of the inner man, where a man is aware of his insufficiency, and is looking for only God to complete him, that man is blessed. You will see the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, that means they're in a situation that is painful, they are hungry physically, they are poor physically, and God is using that situation to make them realize their insufficiency. That state around them is what? Blessed. You know, in our context, if you are poor, they say you are not blessed. If you are mourning, you are not blessed. It's only those that are laughing are blessed. If you read the parallel in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, Both to you that are laughing now, because they don't be for you. He said, what to you that are rich now? What to you that are satisfied now? What to you that people are speaking well of you? All the things that we call blessed, God calls it cost. So we must reorient our minds. We must reorient our minds. He said, blessed are the meek. A heart that is submitted to God, that is instructable by God. He said that heart is blessed because that heart is inclined to listen to God and to serve God. He says, there's the God, they will inherit the earth. That means there are allotments of what God is doing on the earth. They will not miss it. God will ensure that they are part of what he's doing in the world. He will use them. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means those who are hungry, that they want to do what is right. They want to serve God. They want to live a life that is pleasing to God. God will fill them. God will answer their desire. He will fill them. Those that don't want to live in sin, those that are constantly aware when they, when they fall or if they fall and they are, they are aware that they fall and they are doing something wrong, they are hungry to serve God. All their life is to serve God. He said they will be filled. God will fill them. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. And today we're going to talk about how the merciful are blessed, how the pure in, pure in heart are blessed and how the peacemakers are blessed. And you see how the three of them are kind of like really... Like I said earlier, all these virtues of the Beatitudes, it's hard to really separate them in straight, clear lines because they are actually all about a state of heart and state of affairs. Hallelujah. So I said earlier that any state of heart, any situation or state of affairs that inclines us to enjoy God and be satisfied with God, be blessed. Let me now also add that any lifestyle that flows from that state of heart or that state of affairs is also blessed. Joe, are you with me? Praise God. I told you before, I've been saying before, like we've been saying now, that every state of heart and every state of affairs that inclines us to enjoy God and be satisfied with God is what? Blessed. It also follows that every lifestyle, every action, every way of living that flows from that heart or that state of affairs is blessed. And so that's why it says, blessed are the merciful. The state of heart. Let's look at it. It says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. A heart that knows of its insufficiency. A man that knows that it is incomplete. A heart that knows that even me, I am a fruit of the grace of God. That kind of heart is merciful to people. We'll look at the scriptures now. Look at what Jesus said. There is a state of heart where... A person recognizes their insufficiency. 
that all the things that they are enjoying in their life is because of the goodness of God. Such people tend to live a life of being merciful. What do I mean by what it means to be merciful? People that are merciful are people that have mercy on others. There's no other way to say it. You understand that here? People that are merciful are people that have mercy on others. People that, when people offend them, or people fall, or people have an error, they are quick to forgive. When someone is in need, or someone messes up, and someone needs support, they are quick to help. They are quick to show up to help people. When they hear about a person's story or what a person has done, they are quick to judge what they are hearing in the best possible light. This heart has so many ramifications. A merciful heart. A merciful heart. A merciful heart. Someone that even when they are debating with someone, being merciful is that even if the person that you are debating with is saying something in a weak way, you will go out of your way to create the best possible version of what they are saying. Mercy. Mercy. People that are not quick to close the door on somebody else. A merciful heart is someone that in any kind of situation, they are looking at another person that seems to be underprivileged or seems to be... Um, help me now. This echo is too much. Praise God. That's why I'm talking small smoke. I don't want to shout. But I know that once I shout, everyone will just do me. Praise God. Every person that recognizes that other people can be in a, for lack of a better word, underprivileged situation in any way, that they are always quick to raise other people up. These are merciful people. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. They are forgiving people. And it makes a lot of sense that the people who are like this, people who have this kind of hearts and people who live like this, are people that recognize their own insufficiency. They recognize that everything that they have in their life is because of the mercy of God. People who have enjoyed the mercy of God are people that are what? Merciful. And so that's why they are blessed. God will show them mercy. That's why they are blessed. God will be with them. God will show them mercy. Look at Matthew chapter 6, the immediate next chapter. And let's read, read the, let's look at the prayer. Um, the prayer, no, the Lord's Prayer. Verse 9 says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, And then, this, is, this then is how you should pray, the Lord speaking to his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven do our debtors. There's this inseparation between the way people are forgiven and the way they forgive. <clears throat> I remember some time ago we talked about it in, in the, you know in a church group. Verse 13 now says, "And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." There's a connection between receiving mercy and being merciful. There's a connection between receiving mercy and being merciful. Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> Please, my apologies. Sorry for something's going around. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verse 36. <clears throat> we'll read the story. Verse 36 says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. So this woman lived a sinful life. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So this was a woman that was broken and contrite. Yes, she had lived a sinful life, but she was broken and contrite. She was actually crying, and her tears is what she was using to wash Jesus' legs and was, you know, broke her alabaster bro box. That person now says, when the Pharisees who had, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know 
he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him and <laughs> Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Can you see the drama going on there? People are talking on one side. Jesus did not talk to those people. He now talked to Peter. I said, Peter, I want to tell you something. And they were listening. It's like a Yoruba conversation. <laughs> he said, Tell me, teacher. Tell me, Papa. You are not a Sunday school, you are not a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Prophet. <laughs> Verse 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. So one owed 10 times more than the other. Neither of them had money. Oh, thank you very much, God bless <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Which of them will feel more ingrated, ingr- um, 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 ingratiated to him? Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. He says, you have judged correctly. That means, yes, you, are, you, you, you have sense. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me water for my, any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. That's why the Pharisees were the way they were. There's a heart of superiority complex that, can, that, is, that is not blessed, that is cursed. A heart of superiority complex, complex. <laughs> a heart of superiority complex is a cursed state. Is a cost heart. Do you know the reason why? Because people that have superiority complex tend to have a sense that everything that they have in their lives, they earned it, that they deserve it, they achieve it. And so that is the reason why when they look at other people who are in um, um, vulnerable situations, they look at them with that kind of disgust. And because they look at them with that kind of disgust, they tend to be very wicked to people. That's why you see that there's a correlation between legalism and wickedness. Have you not noticed it? People that feel that they have their own righteousness. Have you noticed that they are very unmerciful and very wicked to people who are struggling and vulnerable morally? Because those that, that have been forgiven little will also what? Forgive little. But this is the funny thing. If you feel like as if you've earned what you have, if you feel like as if you've earned your moral state, if you feel like as if your righteousness is your own righteousness, Jesus is telling you here that you have been forgiven little. Do you know what it means to be forgiven little? It means you are going to hell. That's what it means. The reason why you are forgiving people little is because you yourself have been forgiven little. If you know if you are forgiven little, there's no heaven for you. So that's why Jesus says that people that are merciful, people that have that tender-heartedness towards the vulnerable, he says that they will also see the mercy of God. That heart is a blessed heart because it's the God kind of heart. It's the kind of heart that people, of people that know God and enjoy God and are satisfied with God. People that don't know God and have not been satisfied with God are those that feel like they earn what they have. And this thing has ramification not just in moral issues but even in material issues. Stinginess is a sign of being unmerciful. That people are having pangs of need around you and you're not moved. Let them go and walk. <laughs> is it because you are walking that you have the money that you have? People that are walking more than you, Nko. What about people that are walking more than you? Is it because of your work that they gave you five talents? Is it you? Was it not purely the volition of the master? Did you choose the background that you were born to? Even if you want to sing, I start from the bottom now, now I'm here. I was born to a poor background, now I have plenty of money. The skills and ability that you used to amass what you amass, did you not just wake up and find it inside of you? Did you give yourself the talents? Did you give yourself any abilities that you have? Any of your gifts, did you give yourself? Did you not just literally wake up and you were growing up and they were telling you that you are good at this?
There's a, there's a heart of people that know God, that enjoy God, that, and that understand the gift of God in their lives that makes them be merciful to vulnerable people. Brothers and sisters, the Christian hearts, the heart of people that know God cannot be wicked. You cannot have a superiority complex. I like the way Paul Washer says it. He says that if you are intellectually gifted, God gave you the gift so that you can help your brothers. If you are intellectually gifted and you can do systematic theology, your systematic theology is for you to be able to help others, brothers and sisters, understand God more. And this is a big lesson for us. It's a big lesson for us. There's nothing that we know. There's nothing we have come to understand that is not purely the grace of God. Each one of us knows deep down inside that it's not because you are good. All the things that we have known and come to understand, Anu Lariba, is the mercy of God. In the same way, when we see people that are contrite and broken, that truly want to know God, treat them as such. Don't treat them with disdain and disgust. Say, so you don't know anything. Can you not know this? No. Oh. There was a time that you yourself did not know. Disgust must never emanate in our interactions with vulnerable people. This dean must never, this is a lesson for all of us because even me myself, I know in low moments of the flesh, it has come. There are times when the blessings of God are so pronounced in your life that because of, that is the problem with the blessings. May our blessings not become causes for us in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a way that God can bless you and in enjoying the blessing, you have moments of forgetting that the source of the blessing is not you. And you begin to measure your own personal worth by how that blessing has manifested in your life. When that happens, superiority complex will come. Pride will come. We must be merciful to people. Why is it hard to forgive people? And please, I want to make a difference. There's, there's contrition, there is brokenness, there are people who are you know, um, broken and all that. Mercy is for the contrite, all right? So I don't want, I'm not, I'm not using this to mean that, you know, just for people anyhow, but let me just go on. I'll still come there. Listen, why is it hard for some people to forgive? Why is it hard for people to forgive others that have offended them, no matter who the person is? It's because there's usually an assumption either of the person that's the, the, the person who was offended of their um, superiority complex or an expectation from the person that is the offender that they should know better. But a heart that knows that God is our sustenance, both cannot work. You that were offended, that um, because of your superiority complex, you are unmerciful to people's faults. You yourself, it's because of the God's forgiveness and mercy that you are where you are. The person also that offended you, that you're looking at the person that it should not have come for you. You, sh you should have known better and all that. Who should have known better? Who is good but God? Who is good but God? There is no person that is too good to not fall from something. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? There is no person. If Apostle Peter can have a moment of peer pressure and fall into hypocrisy, who are we? That someone has made a fault and the person is contrite. You now say, no, not you, not you. And you now find it hard to forgive the person. I can't take it from you. I can't. No. We are nothing but pencils in the hand of the creator. That's the truth. We must never forget our brokenness. We must, we must never forget our inadequacy. We must always be merciful to people. Because we ourselves have received much mercy. And let me tell you something. See what the Lord said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. When the Lord said that thing, you know, if you come from certain uh, uh, backgrounds, grace backgrounds, you will make it seem like as if um, you receiving mercy is completely uh, kidney. It doesn't matter what you do. Let me tell you something. If you have the wrong heart and you're uncontrite, it means, it means you're not a child of God. It means you will not see mercy. Let me, tell you, let me show you something that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. From verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you seven times, but se not, if I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven 
is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all he, saw, and, and all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Can you see that? The servant fell on his knees. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him only 100 silver coins. You had 100 bags of gold you were owing. These were just 100 silver coins. I like the way Jesus used those particular levels of money to really make it point out, to make it stand. You, you were owned, owing 100 bags of gold. Even by today's standards, who, who has 100 bags of gold? But that's how your sins were. It's even more than that. That's a very good analogy I'm using now. Your sins are like 100 bags of gold. You cannot pay it. Even if you're here in mosque, you cannot pay it. <laughs> They now forgive you. They now forgive you your own. Somebody that now owes how many people? What verse am I in? You people have made me this thing now. Verse 28. One of his fellow servants who owned a hundred silver coins. That means that all the spoons in your house, if we melt everything, we will soon get it. If we gather all the spoons and cutlery in all of this house now, before we find we we'll find hundred silver coins. You that your sins are unforgivable. Someone now offended you with 100 silver coins. He now grabbed him and began to poke him. He says, pay back what you owe me. Abba. His, verse 39, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. This person too now begged you, just as you begged. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he paid the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I counseled all that debt of yours because you begged me so. Shouldn't you have mercy on me, on, on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. You know that one is forever. Yeah, no, there's no way. If they sell all his family, ancestors from Abraham, down, they cannot get 100 bags of goods. That's what we tried to explain yesterday at Seekers Conference. He will say that hellfire is eternal. You now say, uh, it's too long. You see, it's 100 bags of gold. The time required to pay all the sins is eternal. Because the person you offended is eternal. Hmm. Verse 35 now says, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Part of the reason why you find it hard to forgive people is that you look at the person and... You forget, or you assume that maybe you are a good person, that what you have done is not, or the bad things you have done is not so much. I'm not such a bad person. This one is better than me. So, because you're a very bad person, I will not forgive you, brother. Unforgiveness itself is, is evidence that you are worse than the person you are supposed to forgive. Touch out together. See? There's nothing that anybody has done, if they are repentant or contrite, that we cannot have mercy on them for. Because what we have done is much worse. There's a common theme here I don't want you to ignore. The Lord is giving mercy to contrite people. He's a contrite heart, he will not turn back. It is not a rebellious person. So that is where grace goes from grace to hypergrace. This is not extended to someone that, imagine this one standing in front of the master and doesn't kneel down and say, Master, what do they worry you? It's not just under bango goes, you know, get more. I beg, forgive me, it's in the app. You know, that's the problem. They will torture him forever and ever. But when a person is contrite, the psalmist says that a contrite heart he will never turn back. If a person is broken, if a person recognizes, if a person is vulnerable and they recognize that what they have done is wrong, there is no, no matter how big it is, they can't be forgiven. They can't be forgiven. That's why Jesus now, look at what Jesus said. He said, if you don't forgive your brother and sister, my father in heaven too will not forgive you. So it looks, it looks weird, but let me just settle it in your mind now. If you are an unforgiving person, if you're a person with the wicked heart of unforgiveness, you will not enter heaven. No? It's Jesus that said it. And his word is yea and amen. It does not change. You understand now? It's not like Brahmo's former people that he can abrogate what he said, that I said something in the Gospels, but I've changed mouths. 
You understand that? He says, if you are not forgiving, what will happen? My father will not forgive you. He says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What that means is that as a believer, if you are truly a child of God, you have the blessed heart of a believer. Unforgiveness is not an option. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? How can you know what Jesus has done for you and not be willing to extend it to others? If you have been forgiven much, you should also forgive much. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Verse 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. The judgment there is in the, is in the context of condemnation. Right? Co- judge is a loaded word. The context of the word judge must always be used according to the word context. So in this context, the word judge here is about judgment when there's no mercy. All right? Not that a believer cannot judge an evil work and say this work is not good or this thing is not bad. He's talking about condemnation. He says do not judge and you and you do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be what? Condemned. Forgive and you will be what? Forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaking together and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That means God is a rewarder. I remember there was a time where in my mind, I almost started going into the extreme of almost making God agnostic on um, daily, daily reward. As if reward is only at the end of time. Reward is not at the end of the time. Even in daily Christian living, God is sovereign over every little affair. So there is such a thing as instantaneous reward. Now, the reward is not God paying you back for what you have done. It is the Lord approving of your lifestyle. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. It's it's the Lord's approval of your lifestyle. It's the blessedness that comes from living for God. So if you are an unmerciful person, a wicked person, someone that, doesn't, that is not, that is, it has a superiority complex, that is unkind to people, someone is poor, he's trying. He's trying to get something. But Nigeria is hard. Inflation is rising. You now say, did anybody help me? What is wrong with you? He said, did anybody help me? Nobody helped me. That's what that's what come up with people that feel like as if they end what they have in life. Say, so nobody help me. I remember when my uncle said they are bitter. And they're extending that bitterness to other people. So nobody ever helped me. So why should I help him? Let everybody go their way. And all those no. That's why, in the context of mercy, there is even generosity. Give and it will be given back to you. There's generosity in it. Now, this is not for someone that is able-bodied that has an opportunity. Maybe you, you gave him an opportunity for do a job. He said, no, he does not do it. It's only shell. I want to work in another kind of thing. Hey, having mercy on that kind of person is to make him suffer. Blessed are those that mourn. <laughs> so he needs to mourn a little so that he can see God. You understand that? Hey. You, say, you give someone a job. You say, say, that job is beneath me. You don't have work. I said, no, isn't people's food. Now, I'm using guys because, you know, we're trying to raise the bar for guys and all that. But he applies to ladies too. They're waiting for Prince Charming to come and save you from all your sorrows. You're not using yourself. You're not be asking money from everybody, begging everybody for money, begging money. You're not be putting together one key year, two key year, three key year. You're not buying shawarma. The people you're begging money from, the people that you're begging money from, they're not eating shawarma. You know that's what I've been telling you since. It's for those that kneel down and beg the master. That kind of person, there's no mercy involved. He's making mourn. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that are poor. So that they can see God. <laughs> so that person is, he needs discipline. Mercy for that kind of person is what? Discipline. But you see someone that is trying, that is helping. Our bowels of mercy must be open to such people to help them. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. And so you notice something. This state of heart, there's this, it's hard to say it, but it's all connected to those that are pure in heart. That's why I say blessed are those who are pure in heart. There's this state of heart where people are merciful. You know, it's, it's, there's this kind of purity. People that just want to do right by God. People that understand their insufficiency. Their heart is pure. I love the way um, David puts it. Psalms chapter 24. Psalm chapter 24. 
Verse 3 says, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God, from the God their Savior. Hallelujah. There is a kind of purity of heart. It's, it's tied together. It's hard to separate. There's a kind of heart where someone is pure in heart. That's what makes them also merciful to people. Where I just want to do what is right by God. They don't have any selfish and vain ambitions. They are not thinking of only themselves. They are not thinking of how to fulfill only their own um, carnal desires. What they want is just to do right by God. It's because they want to do right by God that they see the vulnerable and they have that same balls of mercy. He says, David says that these people have clean hands. Their mind is all about being pleasing to God. God will be with them. That's why it says that they are, they are, they are um, hallelujah. That's why it says that they will see God because their heart is pure. This is the heart of a believer. You know those scheming, calculative Game of Thrones kind of mind. You know sometimes you watch Game, you watch Game of Thrones, I like watch all those kings, or you watch all those um, thriller movies, or all those kind of drama movies, and you're thinking that, ah, means I can be sharp like this. I will just anticipate people's behavior, just they calculate, so that before they catch me, I'll catch them. No. The Christian heart is actually a pure heart. This kind of heart is vulnerable to being taken advantage of. It's vulnerable to being taken advantage of by the world, but that is okay. In Christianity, that is completely fine. When you suffer for doing the right thing in Christianity, God is blessed it. God is okay with it. It's when you suffer for doing the wrong thing that God is displeased. But if you suffer for being a pure a person, pure in heart, you go to the office and one of the people are trying to scheme to try to set leg and all that, every, your heart is pure. They say that um, 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 this person doesn't even know what's up and everything. It's not as if you are stupid. It's not as if you are foolish. It's not as if you cannot tell that these people have a wicked heart. But you know this person wants to do evil, yet you only repay evil with good. People think it is wise, it is smart to be like, you know, all those movie characters where you can calculate and you repay evil with evil. Set people up because both of you are competing for a promotion. And you are not those kinds of dark things that people have in their minds. The Bible says that the children of God, they will see God because their hearts are pure. There's actually a continual, there's a reward. I'm telling you, there's a richness of the Christian experience that people that are pure in heart enjoy, that people that are calculative and scheming will not enjoy. They will see God. Because God is holy and God is pure. God does not have ulterior motives. God does not... God is not like, um, you know, sorry to say again, most former people, that uh, it can deceive his enemies, that I have things that I have in mind, so I want to deceive you because I want to wicked you. No. That's why they will see God. People that are pure in heart, they have a Christian experience that is rich. They, can, they have all those kinds of experiences in their lives where they know that God is with them because God will continue revealing himself with them. God will be with them. They will know that God, is be, God will be with them. Purity of heart. Not repaying evil with evil. Psalm 73. Surely, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure, in heart. This is actually um, the story of Cornelius is actually the Lord endorsing this for us to understand. Even if you're a pagan, Roman pagan and based on the common grace of God that he has given all of humanity, your heart is pure. You are merciful. You see people that are, that are that, um, that require arms. People that are needy. People that are vulnerable and you give them. You don't know the God unless the God comes to you. But you just have a purity of heart. And that's that purity of heart that you're just praying to a God somewhere. That God, wherever you are, if you exist, oh, that kind of purity of heart. God said, I've heard your prayer. I sent an angel to him. Should I get up to you? There's nothing cool about being a calculating, self-ambitious, um, wicked person. You know there are some people like that. That's when you are talking and things are happening. They have cogs in their brain. 
that is ruling. They are seeing many, many parts to the outcome. They are users. They see people for how they will use them. Some, they are very manipulative. It's better to just assume that those people are not Christians. Check what I'm saying to you. Say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And it is in that same state of affairs, that same kind of heart, that leads people to be also peacemakers. These are people that want to follow peace at all costs, except at the expense of good. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. These people want peace with other people as much as possible. There is nothing cool about saying, that's why all those guys, you know, if you say something, it's be like as if you're just being angry people and all that, but I'm saying this mercifully, all right? Uh-huh. I'm being merciful now, but you see someone saying, I'm, I'm a war, I'm a fight, I'm the kinecon, and you're you boasting about how you, co- you can cause problems for people. You, it's, you, are you even, like, Romans chapter 14. Now, that one looks like a caricature, and everybody's laughing. But have you heard people say, this is who I am, I don't take nonsense. This is who I am. I don't take nonsense. Even in your marriage, you are, boast, you, are, you are proud about the fact that your husband or your wife knows that they can't near you with something. Mm. Mm. <laughs> See, my siblings know. Even my parents know that there are some things. What's wrong with you? Romans 14, verse 9. It says, for this very reason, wait, am I on the right I'm sure it's not chapter 12. Sorry. I think while I was feeling sleepy and preparing this message yesterday, I've gotten it wrong first. <laughs> it's one of the room, it's one of the last chapters of Romans. Follow peace with all men. It's 12, are we? Sorry. Yes. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 9. Love. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual favor serving the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse. 18. Yes, it's verse 18. Must have been really sleepy. Verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is the heart of the peacemaker. And Paul makes it, Paul was really articulate. He says, as far as it depends on you. What that means is that people who are peacemakers want peace. They do not want trouble. They do not want the seed of discord to be among brethren as much as it's within them. There are some things that are beyond you. The things that are beyond you are things that have to do with the will of God. Do you understand that? The things that are beyond you are things that have to do with the will of God. Look at Matthew chapter 10. We will come back here. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Jesus was speaking, he says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now, the peace in this context, Jesus is taking the fact that, see, there's something that is going to happen. If people carry their cross, if people love me, it will cause fights. If people love me, if people want to do what is right, if people want to do what is good, if people want to love me and carry their cross, it will cause fights between them and their family. There's nothing that can be done about it. 
So Paul now says, explaining, that as much as is within you, follow peace with all men. As much as it is up to you. So what is not up to you is that you cannot live sinfully. You cannot reject God because of peace. You understand that? That's not up to you. That's not up to you. That one is not within your power. That one is God's power. And since God will not change his character, he will not change his laws because of you, you too cannot change your laws because of them. So as far as you can, live in peace with others. Children of God are peacemakers. There is nothing cool. I remember you know, when you were growing up and all those kinds of things. There's nothing cool about this carnal idea that you're a troublemaker. Yes, it will make you vulnerable to being taken advantage of. Do you understand that? But there's nothing cool about being a troublemaker. There's nothing cool about being a troublemaker. You are following peace at all costs as long as you're doing your power. So that means that peace that engenders evil is not peace. It's just quietness. Do you understand that? Peace that engenders evil is not peace. It is just quietness. You know, in a graveyard, it is very silent. You know, a graveyard is very quiet. Why? Because everybody's what? Dead. It is true that certain times when Christians are having conversations, it seems like as if there's argument and people are shouting and everything. If all the people that are involved are walking in purity of heart towards each other and are contending for the truth, it is good. If the social media is just quiet and people are going to hell, you're in a graveyard. That's not peace. However, even if we say we're contending for the truth, as much as it's within us, that means the things that we can let go. You know, for example, matters that are disputable, matters that are non-essential, coming to come and cause unnecessary unnecessary rancor over those matters, you know you're not a peacemaker. What it means to actually be a peacemaker is that things that you can let go of, you actually let go of them. This Romans chapter 12 that we just read now is actually, in, if, if, you know, if you read it down and everything, I think that's the reason why I was talking about, I was thinking of chapter 14 and everything. If you read it down, you'll see um, chapter 14 verse 19 says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual words edification. That's Romans chapter 14 verse 19. Okay, that's what I was probably looking at. Let us therefore make every effort to to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. And the context of this chapter was that, if you read verse 1, it says, Accept those who are weak in faith without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another's, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Matters that are disputable, it is not cool to say you are contending for the faith and causing problems over it. Certain matters that are disputable are matters of exhortation and not contention because blessed are the peacemakers. Church, are we together? Mm-hmm. If in a certain church they believe that they want to cover their, they want to be wearing skirts and they don't want to be wearing trousers and all that, as long as they're not saying it, you know, legalism and saying anybody that wears trousers go to hell and all that, is, that is your preference in your church. Live in peace with all men. Do only what leads to mutual edification. Church, all together. There are some things that are even disputable that we don't even realize yet, that we are just because of the way our church is and all that. If a church comes now and says they want to be meeting on Sunday evenings, on Saturday mornings, I hope you know that's a disputable matter. Say you know. Mm-hmm. I know you're already thinking ew in your mind. <laughs> but it is. There are some things that we cannot be quiet about because to be quiet about them is death. For example, someone comes and says, God created Jesus. Or, Jesus is a mode of God. You understand that? Mm-hmm. Someone says, Jesus in the New Testament is not God of the Old Testament, because God of the Old Testament was wicked. If we are quiet, we are just dying. That's symmetry. You understand that? Mm-hmm. There are some things we cannot be quiet about. In fact, it's not up to me. Like, like you understand that as much as it's within you. I'm just following what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. I'm carrying my cross. And my cross is that I will not allow you to lead people to hellfire. It's okay. It will cause fight between father and mother as long as it's because of God. Do you understand that? But as much as it's within us, we must follow peace with all men. Hallelujah. So that's one thing you see in common thread 
with these um, three things, with these three things that we have talked about today, there is a state of heart and there is a lifestyle. There is a pure state of heart and there is a lifestyle of being merciful, being a peaceful person. These, this state of heart and this lifestyle is of people who know God, enjoy God, realize their insufficiencies. They realize their insufficiencies. They realize that everything that we have in our lives is a fruit of the kindness and of the mercy of God. So the world will look at you. Say, listen, there are a lot of things that people don't talk about. Let me tell you one very interesting thing. Do you know that before Constantine made Christianity a illicit religion, being a Christian was like being doomed to be poor. And it's not just because people, Christians took all these warnings very seriously that if you are rich, um, you will not see God and everything and all that. Because there were other reasons why. The other reason is because being a Christian in the Roman Empire then cut you off from a lot of socioeconomic um, infrastructure. Because you wanted to serve God, you didn't want to watch, watch pagan. Their religion was, people think their religion was, um, pagan religions are secular relig um, societies. Trust me, pagan societies are not secular. Secularism is a trick. It's a trick that world governments are using now. They say our society is secular, everybody have your religion. No, it's a trick. Secularism is warm up for paganism. A pagan society is not secular. We don't have religious freedom in pagan societies. You are already seeing the fruits of it now. They are forming a society is secular, but if you go and preach outside, they will arrest you. Is that one secular? They are telling your society is secular, but if your child says they want to change their sex, you cannot talk. They will send you to prison. Is that one secular? Don't let anybody deceive you and say secular society is a free society. It's a lie. You. There's nothing like free society. Every society must submit to one God, either God or the prince of demons in control in charge of that country. The Roman Empire was not free. Part of the thing that Christians were suffering was that there was almost no work they could do. You think that it was Ojulason that Luke was doing um, PA doctor to Paul? Let me tell you things that were happening in the Roman society. Even to do a doctor, to do doctor work, you cannot do doctor work. Because if you go to school and learn doctor work, they, even if they give you a clinic, the gods of um, Escalipos, I've been waiting for the name of that Roman god, the god of health, the priest will be there. You must offer to the priest. You must offer to the God if you're going to be a doctor. It's part of the doctor work. You that you're a Christian, I say Jesus died for me and rose again. You now come and tell you that before you can be a doctor, you must be a Babala Wood with doctor. <laughs> and people didn't realize that the pagan society of Rome, it was completely suffused with paganism. Almost every work you want to do. You know, in the history, they tell us that even butchers, even to be a butcher, that my own work is that I'm, I'm killing cows and everything. Even to be a butcher, you must sacrifice. People that come and buy from your meat will ask you, have you sacrificed? Or before they buy, they want you to have sacrificed it. There was almost no work. So back then, when people were saying, I'm turning to Jesus, Satan, leave me alone, what they were turning their back on was almost everything material in this world. It's not like now that being Christian is even cool. You know it can be cool. Now, you say I'm a Christian, they will just be cool. And that's why we look like unbelievers sometimes. Why am I saying all these things? Is that the Christian heart, maybe because they were close to Jesus, maybe because they were still closer to Jesus and because of that the apostles were with them and then they were just the, the recent mentees and you know the apostles' memory was not far. Maybe that's why. But listen, the blessed state of heart that Jesus describes as the kind of heart that Christians should have is not compatible with, it has limitations in terms of the way you will ball in this world. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot have a pure Christian heart and not still have some kind of material progress. You understand that? God can actually do it for you that the kind of sector that you get into, your pure heart will allow you to do what you want to do. It's possible. And it's even common. It can happen depending on the kind of country that you are living in. But brother and sister, let me tell you something. The real Christian heart, you see the way Jesus describes what it means to have a blessed heart that God is pleased with, that God that will see God, that God is with, that they are children of God, that God will show them mercy. This kind of heart is not easy. It's not compatible with bowling in this world. It's not. It's not. It will actually cost you. 
And so that is the reason why people of this world, of the world, when they look at you as someone that has this kind of heart, they will look at you like a foolish person. Because what the world calls blessed is not what God, what God calls blessed. Brother and sister, do you understand what I'm saying to you? This is true blessedness. This is true blessedness. That you have this kind of heart towards God. When you see, that is why Christianity, we invented the welfare state. Undisputed. No one can see anything. We invented the welfare state. We are the ones that, def- that, knew, that def- decided that if people's cr- poor people should come together and the church states, that is, um, you know, under the bishops, under Greg, Gregory and Co., that we should be taking care of people that are poor because this is the Christian heart. There's a way we're beginning to think now where the world's way of thinking is affecting us. Any kind of doctrine that makes us, has, that makes us to be disgusted by poor people and vulnerable people is not the kind of heart of God. There are some things that are so hard to, to tell people whose minds are already warped. It's very difficult to explain to them. It's very difficult to explain to them. There are certain analogies and certain jokes and certain things that people say about um, you know, in prosperity gospel and everything that actually comes from a heart of disgust for poor people. I don't want to give certain examples. That's how, I'm just, let me just not use that one. This heart that we have, it shows that these ideas and these doctrines, they are not of God. Because the effect that is having, someone might be preaching it from a pulpit. The person might be preaching it just after a powerful worship session. In fact, he can preach it, finish, and do altar call. But these doctrines have consequences. There's a way they shape our heart to begin to become, to become unmerciful people unmerciful it affects our state of mind the way we look at poor people as Christians it's happening right now in this church in this church in this country it hap- it's happening in the Americas where you say um, you say that's why you need to go and make money that God is using certain kind of people you don't talk about Joseph of Arimathea that if God is using them and everything so people that are poor what are they there's a very popular video. Use this example. People should leave me alone. Very popular video that is going around. So comes and you are responsible for hundreds of thousands of souls. If you are being modest, people that are listening to you, your reach is actually in the millions. You know, say I can never be poor in my life. I can never be poor. I can never. <laughs> are poor people goats? What kind of disgust is that? The people that are poor, what happened to them? Are they not human beings? I can never be poor. I can never be poor. You will not be arguing with people and some be using poverty to look at the disgust and disdain. We're talking about prosperity gospel. Some of the same things like um, um, it's always people that are poor that are arguing against it. They are trying to compensate for things not going well in their life. You have manifested what is in your heart. Because in your mind, poor people, they don't have anything going on for them. That's why they are trying to defend rubbish. The disgust. They can never be poor. People that are poor, they are not doing enough. They are not so into enough. It's a very unmerciful heart. It's a very wicked heart. It's a reverse legalism. That's why you notice that these doctrines engender some kind of reverse legalism. Where people begin to feel like they're superior. People that are rich be giving testimonies of how they sow the seed. How they did this. How they did that. And that is the reason why they have what they have. Anybody that is truly rich, go and ask any of them. Anybody that is truly rich, if they want to be honest, they will tell you that it is God. It is God that is giving this thing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You will do your best based on what you have. But brothers and sisters, let everybody lie to you. Eh? Give out of generosity. Have a merciful heart towards your church. Don't look at your church. It's something that you won't talk about. Don't look at your church. Your church has needs. We want to do the gospel. Don't have mercy on your pastors. Don't let them come and beg you before you know that I'm meant to what? Give. Generosity, being merciful is being generous is being merciful. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? People are labor. No, let me not use that one before people now stay here because I've noticed the correlation. If you talk about generosity, that's when you start getting a lot. And I'm not begging you for money. <laughs> Listen, but let me just tell you for the sake of the truth, have mercy on people that are laboring over you. You see somebody spending hours every day breathing prayer meeting. If it takes a you come and be, come and do it. 
You will call the person, you know, like you have a problem. Can you call, can you call? Have mercy. Extend kindness to the person. I'm not talking for myself now. I'm talking for Brasher here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let me brush it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm talking about Brackinsley. Where's Brackinsley? I'm talking about him too. Uh, and, and Brother Mure, why? Let's talk about him too. Have mercy. Be merciful to those that labor over you. Don't just look at them and say they are saying they are doing they are doing what God will help you. That being said, I'm sorry, I said we didn't do that. So that being said, right? Um, it's with these, all these ideas. Make it look like as if um, those that are poor is because they are not doing enough. You see a lot of these questions, a lot of this to say we're having clinical program. I say I, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed last year in the program, but nothing happened for me. It has killed my prayer life. This is the way these people even organize this prayer that is very unmerciful because the way they are planning these programs, they are not even thinking of poor people. Honestly, in their minds, there's a disdain and disgust that engenders the way they even organize those programs because those programs are organized for the rich and for those who want to be rich as if the state of being poor is somehow fundamentally an inferior rate um, state among Christians. There's an unmercifulness to it in the prayers. There's an unmercifulness to it. Imagine someone using your current state as a cause for your enemies. He says, no, imagine it. It's not as if you're doing anything wrong, but in your context, this is the amount of money you have. You are not rich. It's not, it's not because you did anything wrong that you are born in a certain context, with a certain background, you are doing your best. But you are born in this country, you cannot live. This is what you have. Someone now says, um, and because of your state, you, can only, you are eating um, um, twice a day or once a day. Someone is now cursing your enemies and now saying that your enemies will be going through something. I don't want to go into specifics. You now say, your enemies will go through something. And that thing they are talking about is where you currently are. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you, do you see what the person is manifesting to you? The person is expressing to you that your state, what you are going through socioeconomically, is for your enemies. It's a very unmerciful thing. It even affects the way you behave as a pastor. Imagine you are living in a time when inflation is rising mad. It doesn't matter if someone sold a seed and you objectively have money. There's something called mercy. Mercy. You are going through a time where people are going through tough times. People are losing their jobs. People are vulnerable. That is the time that you are doing Instagram reels to show that you are coming down from Jeep, to show that you are traveling to such and such place. They are putting a spread of buffet in front of you. Have mercy. Have mercy. Is it too much for you to be moderate? Are we asking too much for you to be modest? Simple. The, the person that saved you um, so on humanity so that he can go through what you are going through. Is it too much to ask for you to go through what people are going through? Is it too much for you to ask? Maybe this is not the time to be buying expensive shirts. Maybe this is not the time to be showing off swag. Maybe this is not the time to be showing off how much money you have. Maybe this is the time to use the money instead to help people. Is it too much to ask? Do you understand? It's not beef. It's not um, anger and everything. It's just being honest. This is not the time. So there's a thing about it. It's not as if if I want to go and look. You see, you, I've told you people. If I want to harass you and collect money from you, I have gifts. <laughs> I will collect money and you'll never feel bad. You'll even be thanking me on top. <laughs> but this is not the time that I'll come and wear one bad suit. Or wear clothes that has a um, lapel with this thing and all that. And just like, see, I'm living with people that, these are my people. Some of my people don't have work yet. Any extra money I have now is to look for a house where I can house them. Some people don't have house. This is not the time to go and buy Ferragamo, offend them with Fendi. This is not the time. It's called mercy. I'm so sorry I've not forgotten myself. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. On this note, I should say this. Listen, if there's anybody here in our church, one of our core values is that all our money is for supporting people. We don't have problem. As long as we can hear our voice in the message, church is set. If anybody has any needs, 
if anybody is going through a tough time, there is no food. Food, clothing, and shelter as your church, as your family. It is our responsibility for God to use us for you. If anybody doesn't have food, please don't just <laughs> come into church and say, say you are fasting. You are not fasting. <laughs> Let us know. That's what we are here for. There's nothing to be shy about. There's no pride. All right? Let us know. We'll take care of you. At least we have that one. We cannot give you everything. You understand that? But that one, uh-uh, you will eat, you will fat. You understand? May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord our God. 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 Let our hearts be posture before him and bless his name. Let our heart be prostrate before him. Oh God, don't lamb upon the throne. You that ransomed us by your blood. Thank you, Jesus. You that ransomed us by your blood. Thank you, Jesus. You that kept us by your blood and gave us a new heart. You gave us a new heart. Thank you, Jesus. A pure heart. A merciful heart. A peacemaking heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, our lives are before you. There is no like unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, our lives are before you. Our lives are before you. Our lives are before you. In accordance to your instruction, Lord, we desire, we pray, we ask. Continue to renew the hearts of flesh between us, O Lord. Give us a pure heart. Renew the purity of our heart. Renew our heart to be merciful. Renew our heart to be peace-loving people. Renew our heart to be just like you, O Lord. To be loving and yet firm. To be kind and yet fighting for the good. Give us a pure heart, O Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Jesus, I also pray the benediction of Psalms. Just say amen as we pray together. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. Amen. May the name of God, of the God of Jacob, protect you. Amen. May he send you help from the sanctuary. Amen. And grant you support from Zion. Amen. May he bless all your sacrifices. Amen. May he bless all your offerings. Amen. May he give you the desires of your heart. Amen. And may he make all your plans to succeed. Amen. May we shout for joy in victory Amen. and lift up the banners of the name of our God. Amen. Some may trust in chariots, some may trust in horses, but we will depend and trust in the Lord our God alone. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.